Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, let me just turn off my little stuff here. Hi, everybody. <laughs> well, welcome to our, I don't know how many we've done now, the latest in our caregiver series. These are expressly geared towards people who are themselves uh, caregivers or family or friends wanting to be. And also, I hope on the call are some folks who would identify as patients, the person ostensibly receiving care, too. I think the more we understand about these various roles, the smoother things can go and the more empathy that's flowing, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, hi. I feel that if I seem a little frazzled, because I am. Um, so I'm going to just try to settle on into this. And as always, guys, this one's a small one. There's not a ton of you on the line today. So um, maybe those of you who are here have been here before, and you already know this. But again, these things are meant to be intimate, um, safe, a place to say or ask just about anything, feel just about anything within some basics of moral or morality. Um, so, you know, these are are meant to be precious um so you don't there's no pressure to say or do anything here you can just listen that's fine too um let's cut over to my dear friend sonia real quick for some more details hey good morning everyone thanks for being here so i just want to share a little bit about how you can interact with us um, after bj's had a chance to go through the slides and share a little bit about caregiving so once he's done that um you can check in with a question um, or share an experience two ways. You can raise your hand. There's a little button with a hand and we will unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. Or um, if you would prefer to not speak out loud, you can type your question into the question area down below and I will read it and we can get it answered that way. So two, two ways to do it. You can raise your hand and ask the question yourself, or if you'd prefer to remain anonymous um, or just want to type it in, you can do that down in the question area. And um, the anonymous note brings up something else. If you would prefer to remain anonymous and not have us read your name, that is absolutely okay. Please just um, make a note so that we can be sure to not mention your name if that's your preference. And um, if we don't get through all the questions, we'll be sure to record an extra um, Q&A at the end, uh, we'll, we'll do another session here. So if we don't get to your question, please know that we will get it answered in some form or another. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Sonia. Okay, guys, um, let me just make sure my phone shut up. Um, okay, all right, with that, here we go. Um, those of you who've been to caregiving, Sam, there's you know, maybe we'll change this up on these days, but there's gonna be a lot of repeat information in the slides just to set us up, set the table, get us on the same page. So one thing to think through in caregiving right other shoots is uh, the timing of things. So there's all sorts of medical details you may or may not wanna know about the person you're caring for, um, but you know, prognosis, prognosis, that is the sort of best guess of how much time a person has to live or has to deal with whatever the issue is can be useful because it's very different. Say caregiving for someone who has a broken bone or something that, you know, maybe a tough slog for a few months, but who will heal and um, regain function. That's a very different enterprise than is someone who's say in the throes of advanced delir uh, dementia or cancer or heart disease or any advanced stages of a chronic or terminal illness where um, you only generally speaking lose function and things get harder, and things can play out over months or years. Dementia, I think the average caregiving spell is something like four to six years. So um, knowing that up front can help you portion your energies, because it is this is um, hard work. So as you know, you can't sprint for a marathon. Um, so knowing what you're getting into can help you settle into a pace and a rhythm. And, some things are going to be plain days where just not everything gets done and you just kind of keep on rolling and have some faith that'll get done the next day or not at all and that's just going to have to be okay too you know this is a time sometimes to get this this enterprise can get very very practical even with this very spiritual and emotional framework there's only so many hours in a day you do what you can and let it go um all right, so that's one big point to consider and how you marshal your energies. 
So um, one way or another, the ADLs, the activities of daily living, will come up either explicitly or otherwise. These are sort of the six domains, uh, official sort of medicalized domains of activities of daily living, of practical, functional bodily life. Obviously, these, these have emotional, emotional, psychological kind of issues that come along with these things, but there you can tell they're the, the, the care of the body, as we know, medicine, that's basically where medicine focuses its efforts around life is, is, is at the body function. Um, so this is an incomplete list in a sense, but it is the list from a functional standpoint. It has some, the, the ADLs has some significance beyond just sort of describing things. This is how insurance companies will tell whether you qualify for home care or other kinds of services is how dependent someone is, a patient is, and their ADLs. So just knowing that lingo can be helpful. You might hear it thrown around one way or another. But these are basically what you might imagine, the, the basics of daily life, bathing, dressing, eating, transferring, and moving. That's just, in other words, getting out of bed, getting out of the chair, and moving around the planet. Um, toileting, getting to and from the bathroom or a commode or bedpan, and continents, uh, a huge issue. Um, Many, many folks suffer from either fecal or urinary incontinence uh, one time or another through their lives, sometimes sort of part of a disease process or something else going on. But continence is a huge one. Uh, that of, of these, well, I don't know which has the most emotional sort of layover here, but continence is a, a real big one. A lot of folks who otherwise love life, the demoralizing sort of loss of dignity that a lot of people uh, is suggested in incontinence. I'm not saying that they're inherently anything undignified about incontinence, but a lot of people, that's their bottom line. I have some people whom I love very much and who are very close to me, and that is their bottom line. So it's not a small thing at all, and getting help in it can both be embarrassing and difficult and really important. So anyway, I don't mean to harp on that one, but it's here it is, just another word and a list, uh, but boy, it's a doozy. Okay, um, in one thing to note around the art and craft of caregiving, or giving care, caring, is it's a relationship. It's not just a, don't, you know, this is medicine, modern life is we've really done ourselves a disservice by sort of approaching everything as a transaction, you know, get it done and then move on to the next thing on a list. I mean, there are certain parts of life that are absolutely fall into that kind of rubric, but behind that, underneath that, this is always a relationship, and we really need to name that so we can tend to it and care for it. Um, this is where I think a lot of more medicine and healthcare leaves us wanting is because it's very hard to form a relationship with our doctors given the way things are set up, et cetera. Um, so seeing caregiving as a relation, caring and caregiving, care receiving as a relationship, not just a sort of a, a dynamic, not just a transaction. All right, I'm repeating myself. I told you I'm a little frazzled. Okay. But the thing to note here is, you know, a lot of us, so we sign up for it. We, hey, I love you. Of course I'm going to care for you. Yeah, you know, whatever, whatever you need. When it's my turn, you'll care for me. And, you know, this is, so to put too much language and official number on this can feel a little off-putting too. A lot of spouses and friends don't see themselves as a caregiver. They see themselves as a spouse or friend. But just to note, especially over time, this dynamic of caring, caregiving, can change change the relationship. The role of a spouse or loved one moving from that sort of open-ended, side-by-side phenomenon to one where the other person is increasingly perhaps dependent on us, that can change the dynamic. If we move from the bodies being experienced as simply an avenue of joy and childbirth and sexual exploration, who knows what, moving around the planet, all of a sudden becomes this thing we have to take care of and can't function without us. And all of a sudden you're wearing a hat of nurse or social worker or aide or even doctor or lawyer. I mean, pulling on all this, this all this toggling between roles can be exhausting and can really strain a relationship. So the thing here is just to name it. It's natural. It's all happen. And to some degree, it's, you know, just happens. To some degree, though, you can, you guys, both, both sides of the coin, patient and care can uh, can shift it, can move it, can name it, can make sure to take the nurse hat off and watch a movie together as spouse, as friends. Um, make sure to whatever be possible, the patient is able to give something back to the caregiver, et cetera. But naming it as a dynamic as relationship is really key and tending to it as such is really key. And it's also part of the sorrow that can go with this work is uh, um, parts of the relationship can go, can be lost, um, even while others are forming. 
So a lot of action in this slide here. And one of the great, one of the things that happens all the time is, especially maybe a caregiver out of pride or just being too close and not noticing one day to the next some changes. Um, so an infrequent visitor or a nurse can come into the house and all of a sudden see all sorts of decline in a patient that the caregiver didn't even notice. The caregiver is just slowly coming to a boil and burned out and one day the next you don't notice. Um, so it can be hard to know when you need help or when you need something that's not there. Um, outside eyes can be very helpful or you as a caregiver checking in with the doctor or stepping out of this role to kind of look at the whole scene with fresh eyes. Maybe it's time to call on a home health aide. Maybe it's time to organize those friends and families who have been wanting to figure out some way to help that you've been keeping at bay. But one way or another, it's very, especially in advanced illness, this is not, this is a team effort. So enlisting help is really key, not just for you, but also for the patient. That's not a weakness, that's being very smart. You know, so of all the roles that you might find yourself in as a caregiver, one I think that needs to be named and is really, really important um, and different from others in terms of the functional stuff, et cetera, is this idea of witnessing, bearing witness. Being with a person as they move through changes in life, some of them, many of these things outside of one's control and how do we respond to these things and the pains we suffer and the quiet indignities and the losses and the confusion. A lot of just this, we just blow past it, whether from politeness, we're not paying attention or whatever. So really pausing now and again, routinely and seeing each other, both you seeing your patient as such, seeing them for all that they are, smelly or otherwise, them seeing you for all that you're doing, et cetera, is a really, really key. It's, this is, in my mind, really closely related to, to love and something we can do for each other. In other words, not sort of squinting, pretending something's not going on or pretending the person's like they used to be when they really aren't. Actually, no, kind of catch up to reality. Be with whatever is. It's hard to do, but it's really, really important to do. And unless we do this for each other, illness or caregiving can be incredibly lonely because no one's seeing all that we're doing. They may see our per person, but they're not seeing they're not seeing us. So take time to see each other. It's really, really important, really, really healthy, really, really beautiful. And pretty simple. You just drop your judgment and be with someone, whatever they are. Okay, this has to be named. I mean, there are about 44 or 45 million caregivers in the US, informal, that meaning unpaid caregivers who are trying to help out with someone at home while holding down a job. That's sometimes referred to as a sandwich generation. Those people, you know, around my age who may have parents in the later stages of life and a kid at home. Um, that's the sandwich. You're the creamy filling in the middle. Um, it's not easy. And we don't have policies in place quite yet. We're, there's some work on that. But trying to hold down a job and be present for your job and do good work there while all these things are tugging on you is <laughs> really, really hard. Increasingly, employers are aware of this. So HR programs, it may be worth reaching out to them about their leave policy, but also do they have any caregiver training or support programs that they can link you to? I don't mind telling you guys, we, Metal Health, is trying to start serving that need and working with employers. Stay tuned on that front. Um, so anyway, just to name, this is a real phenomenon. It's a very common phenomenon, and it's done. So there's a lot of suffering and silence here. So I uh, just want to name it. Um, and it also points us to, I think, the importance of this uh, um, this next slide, which is, you know, it almost feels funny to name self-care in some own slide, like, oh, yeah, do all these amazing, do all these crazy things, put up with all this stuff. Oh, and don't forget to take care of yourself. At the end. It just feels kind of ridiculous. Um, and yet, you know, the norm is that caregiving ends up being the sacrificial pursuit. We just dump ourselves. We re Caregivers typically start denying their own needs, their own life, their own health can start going to hell in a handbasket. And we sort of think that this is what caregiving looks like, that it, the part of what the love you're conveying is meted out in the sacrifice itself. I'd love it if we could all kind of try to find a different way, a different dynamic, because, boy, as a patient, I don't want my caregivers burning out. I don't want my caregivers losing their sense of love and life and, and for their own sake. Oh, and that, that doesn't really serve me as a patient or it certainly doesn't serve me as a caregiver. So, um, but yet here we are. So 
I do think we need to name this silly thing called self-care. I say silly because it should be taken for granted. Of course, we need to take care of ourselves. If we've got nothing left in our tank, how can we be there for anybody else? So the, the one of the things I know I need to drill into myself and others sometimes kind of operate under old thinking is to, is to say, you know, even if your goal is to be the most amazing caregiver in the world and be there for people in all sorts of ways, um, and you really don't care about your, like you're so, it's not that you don't care about yourself, but you're so flexible in life that you get so much joy out of caring for others. That is your kind of a self-care. So leave me alone with the self-care stuff. I just want to take care. I just want to be there for others. Well, I'd still say to that person, yeah, yeah. Well, to do that because you are a fleshy human being with needs of your own, sorry, um, you know, and vulnerabilities of your own. If you want to be there for others, you need to take care of yourself, even if you can't find it for your own sake, to do that for your own sake. Take care of yourself for the, on, for, on behalf of your patients or your family members or people you're trying to care for. That's the link. These things are, they're not at odds. It's not like I'm either selfish and take care of myself or selfless and take care of others. That is completely false. That's a false dichotomy. It only causes pain. Do not buy into it if you can help it, even though it's all over the place. Push back on that. See loving yourself, caring for yourself as part of your job if you need to. So, um, okay, maybe we'll bring these back into conversation here. Um, oh, I knew I'm going to do that. Okay, so I'm kind of whizzing through this because I think a lot of folks on the call have been through many of these sort of points before. I don't necessarily want to belabor them too much. So maybe we can get to comments, conversation, people sharing their own experiences as caregiver or as patient. What's it like to be on the receiving end of this? Any questions so far, comments? Anyone ready to peep, peep up, peep, peep up, <laughs> peep up? <laughs> yes, I think we have we have a peep that I can I can read here. Um, this person, it's a, a little bit of a longer question, so I'll read the whole thing. Um, this person says, my mother is 78 and lives across the country and I rarely see her. She seems to have severe short-term memory loss in addition to physical ailments related to being overweight and asthmatic, but it's the mental awareness of what's going on around her that is most conspicuously lacking and distracting. Mm -hmm. um, she's living in the past, but has no ability to charge her phone or do most of what it takes to get through the day. What mm -hmm. would be your recommendation for seeking care and improving her quality of life? To my knowledge, she has never seen a doctor about this condition. Mm -hmm. Well, from what you're describing, and first of all, thanks for laying that out for us. I mean, it does not sound easy, of course. Um, especially being across country must be extra hard. Um, so, you know, a couple of things. So from what you're describing, it doesn't quite sound like this. But if, if your mom um, would qualify for hospice, for example, I mean, what you're describing in the short-term memory loss is maybe early onset or, or early stages of dementia. That's possible. And dementia is a terminal illness. And uh, some dementias do um, progress more rapidly so that she may qualify for hospice at some point soon. If not now, maybe. I do, this is, I'm taking in generalities. But I'm starting on this one because this would be the hospice is the way to get the most services into your home and have them be covered by insurance. Um, hospice by itself tends to not be fully adequate. You still need a lot of friends and family and other people doing stuff, but it is the way to get, it's practically the closest way to like, rent a family on, in, on site. Um, so it's a wonderful suite of services if you qualify. And you mentioned some other health issues. So, you know, one thing to do would be to push her to talk to her, her doctor, or next time you're out there, go to her doctor together, or if there's someone else who can go with her, or try to get her engaged in front of a physician to prognosticate and to look into the natural course of things to see if there's anything to push back on, but also then give you a sense of what's coming. If she qualifies for hospice, I don't think so from the sound of it now, that would be the way to go. Um, we can talk more about that in detail. Shy of that, well, then you there are well, there's a home care benefit on insurance, depending on how many ADLs she needs support with. Um, so that may be a way to qualify for home care. You need to talk to the doctor there again be a prescription and a process, but that may be a way to qualify for home health aides to come into the home a few times a week and check on things. A nurse checking on medical management, pill box, getting things in pill boxes and having a you know suite of eyes on your mom. That's uh, the next sort of official way within the health, health insurance world that would be paid for. 
Next is consider whether you have long-term care insurance. If, if she does have long-term care insurance, she may qualify for home health aides to be there for you know, part of the day, all, uh, much of the week, and that can be invaluable. You know, um, so, and then that's, so, that's what might be covered by insurance. Um, outside of insurance, uh, whether uh, you know, you're paying out of pocket or you can find some friends and family to volunteer, you might start arranging if she's got family or neighbors you can check in on her start arranging some from remotely you, have, you know people to just to stop by check on her see how things are going you have other eyes on the ground there with her informally or you might consider calling a home health agency if you can afford it and and paying for an aid it tends to be 20 or 30 dollars an hour the agencies you know, that can be hit or miss, but otherwise you can look, you know, ask around. And sometimes caregivers do this work informally under the table and they're not advertising, but word of mouth. There are communities that have folks that just move around within the community and do this kind of work. So looking out for home health aides through agencies or hiring directly to a person directly. Um, that there's a lot to say about that process. You need to find the right fit. It's really hard work. It does not pay well, but there's some incredible uh, home health aides out there. They just uh, just do incredible work. Some are willing to move in and be live in. So that could be invaluable. And then lastly, of course, is other family, other folks. You know, is this all falling to you? Um, this is whether to be there for your mom or to arrange folks to be there for your mom is to see who else can help you do this kind of work and, and to even to set it up. There are other details. People can set up cameras in the home so, so you can have eyes on your mom from across the country. That may be a, a non-starter for all sorts of reasons, but some people have found that to be useful. So anyway, there's a suite of ideas for you to consider. If you're still there, if you're willing, uh, shoot, shout back here. Let me know if any of that makes any sense, if that seems reasonable or, or totally, <laughs> totally unreasonable. We can talk and we can back and forth this for a moment. Um, quick question that came to mind just from me when you were talking about that. Do you have any suggestions about what to ask when um, hiring outside caregivers or suggestions for things? to? Yeah, well, you, you know, this is someone you're hiring to do pretty intimate work and be there for mom in, in all sorts of ways, potentially, including all this sort of help with toileting and bathing and, you know, very vulnerable work. And being there with her to hear her. So there's a personality that goes with this. Of course, interviewing a couple different agencies or aides to make sure there's a personality fit. You wanna know what experience they have, of course. Have they done this work before? Do they have references? It depends how far you wanna take it, but um, that can be very useful. An experienced caregiver is an amazing thing. I mean, they've just seen, you know, they've just seen it all and they can find their way through any situation. They know when to worry, when not to worry. So asking their level of experience, if they work in institutions or in people's homes, checking references, like I say, can be really key. Um, home health agencies will do much of that work for you, but it's pretty basic. They basically do some a little bit of training and a, and a criminal background check, and that's about it. So, uh, but an agency will give you at least that much of support. Um, but uh, also asking them their availability over time, because these are relationships that you want to rely on. And if the person's only available, you know, a couple of days a month, but, you know, and only for this or that, that this month or next or something like that, you just want to know that so you can plan accordingly. From what you're describing, your mom has a long road ahead of her. If this is early dementia, dementia generally goes on for five, six, seven years. So, again, we're in a marathon kind of scenario which begs the next point, which would be at some point, at some point it may make sense for mom to move into a nursing home or, or a memory care center, potentially. I'm not saying that that's true, but that would be on a list. Um, so anyway, Sonia, yeah, that, those would be the big things. Experience, references, availability, um, the, uh, those are the big ones. Great. Um, we had another question come in while you were talking, and it says, are there any specific self-care exercises or activities you can recommend for caregivers, especially if timing and budget are tight? Yeah, I mean, I think the basics, it's sort of like the basics of self-care at any time of life, that just the stakes are a little bit higher. So it may it most certainly amounts means some amount of physical exercise, moving your body, whether that's going to a gym, yoga, dance, walking, running, biking, just moving your body. 
and from where I sit, moving your body outside, getting outside can be a really key piece of that. So one is getting your blood moving, getting your body healthy, eating, you know, eating, this is the basics, go back to the basics, eating well. Um, the outside piece is, 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 is not just to a good place to exercise, but I find there's a lot of inspiration waiting for us in nature. You know, what we're talking about here is a body doing something natural, which is breaking down, you know, uh, getting sick, eventually dying. That's what bodies do. It's nature teaches us oh, it's, oh, that cycle life is accessible all the time. So being in the woods and just feeling that might make you can be inspiring and can, can help morale. You realize what you're doing here is ancient, is natural, is important. Um, not this closeted weird thing that, you know, the, the way society might have us think about it sometimes. So nature is a big one for me anyway. Um, some sort of expressive. Uh, um, so we know this comes with a lot of feelings and a lot of these feelings don't, there's no resolving them. They just need to be vented. They just need to, you just may need to be witnessed and heard. So that's two different points. One be some expressive art, writing, journaling, painting, screaming, talking with someone, uh, another person who gets it or just listens well, getting stuff off your chest um, can be really, really key, all right? Another one would be, and that's we know that from data, another one would be a contemplative practice, whether that's prayer or meditation. These are ways to kind of settle your nervous system into just being with whatever is. You know, so sorts of things that can't be fixed in this situation. It's not just these aren't all problems to solve. You got to learn to find a way to just be with the situation um, and de-stress and tone down the anxiety. And you can't stay in these hyper vigilant states all the time. Caregiver, good caregiver, you know, you want to make sure everything's right with the patient, and which can lead to a lot of worry. You know, you, you may feel like you have to keep this hyper vigilance. But that can't work for more than a few days at a time. That's an acute kind of mode. You can't chronically stay in there without doing harm. So you got to find, look for ways, if not relax, at least to let go. Like things are going to be what they're going to be. A fall might just happen. Death is going to just happen. So finding a way to live a contemplative existence and be with what things that you can't change is really, really key. And to settle your nervous system wherever you can. Um, so those are the big ones, a contemplative practice, some sort of physical exercise practice, those things can go together, um, and some sort of expressive practice. Uh, and then uh, also I think it's very important, like the, your own, you know, the empathy, your own, let yourself feel the patient, your patient's feelings. You know, that can be a, a real connection for you, and connecting with your patient and others is really, really key. And you might schedule an evening where you're not doing patient caregiver stuff. You'll make sure to, if it's depending on the nature of the relationship, for your own self-care, maybe that tonight, you know, there's no, we're not talking about illness, whatever, we're just going to watch a movie and be buddies or whatever it is. That can be really helpful for both parties. Um, okay, so those, that's, a, that's, that's a basic list. Um, and anyone else on the call, please chime in if you got other ideas. We do have a hand up here. Jennifer, I'll unmute you right now. And you may need to unmute yourself on your end. Oh, there you are. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Great. Uh, first, a comment, which is just that this still life with ham, lobster, and fruit is cracking me up on the self-care slide. So <laughs> um, I think all we about all are. <laughs> um, but uh, this is a question maybe for people, other other participants. Um, so my, I, I cared for my stepmom. I spent a month with her earlier this year when she had been diagnosed with kidney cancer and she had a surgery. And thank goodness, like things have gone as well as possible. Like no mm -hmm. sign of additional cancer, not having to do radiation and chemo and all that stuff. And um, so what a blessing, but also there's still this whole like shadow effect, you know, and, and I noticed for myself and I think for her that the acute moments are almost easier to rise to. And mm -hmm. it's that sort of like more plateaued period um, that at least for me, like I, I, definitely felt a big strain 
Mm. So I'm moving back um, to the Bay in a couple of months just to be closer to her, um, you know, as she ages and does all that stuff. And I anticipate more caregiving or explicit caregiving in my future. And I've been thinking a lot about how as the daughter, it challenges, it's challenging. And I'm just trying to kind of cultivate some empathy for what it's like to be the mother who now has to get cared mm. for by the daughter. So I just wondered, you know, either BJ or others on the call or Sonia, if people have perspective with being that kind of like elder now asking from, for help from their, from their child or um, if anybody has any perspective just to help me be a little more empathetic to what that might be like for her. Mm. Wow, what a beautiful question, Jennifer. Um, I'll, I'll shut up for a second, let anybody else jump in here too. Any, any hands up? I don't see any hands up, but it does, um, you know, what you're talking about, I also experienced with my mom, and there is a definite um, shift between someone who has cared for you your whole life and all of a sudden you have to care for them and it does absolutely bring up um pretty difficult emotions like it's really it's hard to see your parent um falling apart and you know doing things that we don't consider to be normal and not being able to you know use their body in the same way so it is it is rough um so i think it's really lovely that you're wanting to be empathetic and understanding to that situation it is it is hard there is something about that shift that um is psychologically difficult to deal with and i'll, I'll add you know from what you're saying jennifer too it's as you, i think what if i'm hearing your question correctly part of what's hard as Sonia's saying is you know, if you dare to imagine what it's like for your mom, you know, dare to imagine what it's like to actually need this care. I'm so glad to hear you wondering that out loud um, because that's also brutally hard. I mean, me on the receiving end is, as you can imagine, really tricky. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes we don't let those real, those, that we don't wrap that realization in because I don't know about you, but I and others that I've worked with him be so, it's like you're up to your eyeballs and if I have to then also imagine how hard this is for the person on whose behalf I'm working so hard, it can feel like too much. But it's actually a really, really key step because that cracks open the empathy that really gets the love flowing both ways. And that really is actually a great source of self-care. So I really want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing, which is, yes, be true to your own feelings of what it's like to be in your role and to entertain and invite sort of understanding and realizations about what it's like to be in the other role. That's healthy and gorgeous. Um, so one idea on that note is simply to ask mom, you mm -hmm. know, hey, what's, a, what's this like? I got to imagine it's pretty hard. I know it's hard for me and you took care of me and here I am doing this is, you know, what's, what's that like for you? You know, I don't know, I'm just making some words up, but just, this could be a beautiful conversation. Is she in a position to actually talk to you about these things? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, she, she's she got a lot of hard edges, a lot of mm -hmm. walls up. She's just always been that way. And so in some ways that those shells have hardened as she's aged, you know? Mm -hmm. But I will say, I just... Uh, I actually bought your book not long before I went out to see her and I found it immensely, some chapters more than others, like immensely helpful because there were times where I just, I, I thought to have conversations that I mm. wouldn't have thought of. And I think, you know, like when you just said that, can you just ask your mom? I was like, well, duh. <laughs> you know? um, so yeah, I definitely can. Um, and I will. Beautiful. I have... Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say one more thing about that, but I didn't want to cut you off, Jennifer. Oh, I just wanted to say out loud that um, in this year, both with her cancer diagnosis, but also supporting an, an elderly person living alone in COVID and crazy times, this series has been a really helpful touch point for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to to speak that appreciation into the space. 
Oh, man, that's nice to hear, Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah, it's mm. funny because we don't, you know, we don't, we're just talking to a little machine here. Who knows what? <laughs> um, so that's really nice to hear. We love doing these. We will keep doing these. Um, we're going to keep trying to find other ways to work with each other and talk with each other and be there for each other. So I'm so glad to hear that. Um, you know, what I wanted to say, as you were describing, you know, that sort of like, duh, why don't I just ask her? Well, you know, I would also encourage you, depending on the dynamic, and, you know, the, the, these are series of conversations and things that to sh chart over time. You may ask them on the same question, you know, now in another six months and a year, and the an answer may change. Mm -hmm. One. Um, but also part of that conversation is to invite in, and it may be, again, this is generic advice, and it may not feel quite right, especially as you describe hard edges, et cetera. You know, those conversations should be exchanges. So letting her tell you what it's like, asking her, see, wanting to know, to be on the receiving end, um, but also look out for where you can also share what it's like with her on your end. Because mm -hmm. again, this is a relationship, not a one-way street. So, you know, keep an eye out. And on that note too, I think it's really, really, I have found it very, very helpful to say, I think a lot of us presuppose that a person in their mom's shoes doesn't want to talk about things, doesn't want to look, we're all in denial, whatever it is, or that it's, you know, impolite to talk about some of these things, or it might be scary. But I found in general, folks who are actually living with illness and watching their lives change, it's hard as hell, including keeping up the veneer. So sometimes well people just let, keep your ears peeled when you're with your mom or talking to your mom she may make little comments now and again that just crack a window open like statements like i'm oh, sure i'm sick of this treatment can't wait till it ends that may be an invitation to talk about well hey mom this do we want to change gears here is this really what you want you know we can always say no to treatment or maybe there's something else to try or let's talk to doc or whatever else but those are little opportunities listen for those little invitations i think in the rest of life we we think it's I watch myself sometimes suppose that the person kind of slipped and opened something that they didn't want to open. I think almost feel like it's polite to just not go there. It's probably never true, but certainly in this situation with this subject matter and this backdrop, those little casual kind of throwaway comments are very often mom sort of throwing out a little trial balloon. See if, see if you're willing and able to talk about it or if you have ideas or so listen for those. They may seem like throwaway moments, but they can often be invitations to walk in. Or someone who's been gripped and never wants to talk about death, and they finally make a comment like, you know, gosh, I wonder what's coming next for me, or, or I can't, you know, not, I don't know, whatever it is. Those can be little conversation starters. Can, does that make sense, Jennifer? Am I making sense? Yeah, completely. completely. Yeah, those because they're easy to make. Kind of keep on cruising accidentally and blow right past them. But if you're listening for them, those can be real invitations to deepen the engagement and hear new things and share new things with mom. Um, and I guess the other thing to remember this is over time. So again, she'll change, her mood will change. Someday she'll want to talk, someday she won't. And that's cool. Just bob and weave. This I think a lot of this stuff begs for a kind of a, a, my favorite word these days is agility. You move. It's a dynamic that shifts one day to the next, and let it let it shift. And you can get really good at surfing it. Some days you can tell mom the last thing she wants to do is talk to you about this or that. And some days she's all tenderized, and that's exactly what she needs. And, and then again, I'll just remind you: you too, you get to have days where you don't want to talk about this stuff, and you get to have days where you really need to. And that's totally fine. You can say, "Mom, I I'm sorry if this hurts, but I need to talk to you about X, Y, or Z." Mm -hmm. Does that sound realistic? Mostly. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. I, you know, the, the, for me, like you mentioned, con contemplative practices and mine, both in the pandemic and this caregiving role, have become more and more important to me. And yeah. it occurred to me when you were talking, like, you know, when you were talking about that sort of active listening, like keeping your ear to the ground, that that's part of that, those are connected, you know, right. the more kind of, calm my nervous system is, the more attuned I am to my environment, the more I can pick up on that. So, I mean, that's part of what I think the beauty of what I get from this role too, so. Oh, amen, Jennifer. That's what a beautiful comment. That's right. These aren't just, 
these are, this isn't just work. You get to get bigger from this work too. You get to get more sensitized, more tenderized, more aware, all that. So beautiful. Thank you for saying that. That is gorgeous. And and as you were saying that, it's making me remember too that, you know, words are great and there's a lot that we exchange either written word, writing letters to, you know, some folks do better with letter writing. That's another way in, but words are cool. But of course, there's this world beyond words, communicating through touch and silence, eye contact. Excuse me. So making sure to work to apply those tendrils as well as points of connection, ways of learning, ways of hearing, ways of understanding somebody or a situation. Tune in on that plane too, that unspoken plane too. It sounds like you already are, but that's that's a really rich place, oftentimes for both parties. Touch. Foot rub can be can can impart all sorts of love that words can't. You know? So mm -hmm. that's stuff too. Yeah. Well, thanks, y'all. Stay well. You too, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we have another hand up here, Judith. Maybe you were hoping to chime in on that discussion with Jennifer. I mm. just unmuted you. You might have to unmute yourself on your end, or of course, if you have another question unrelated, that's fine too. Um. I, I did want to kind of chime in on the on the question, but actually everything that you said was exactly what I was going to say. So mm -hmm. what I find is just the fact that, that Jennifer is asking that question about the empathy means mm -hmm. that she already has it. Right on. Yeah. And, and um, I was also going to say that a lot of it is active listening. You know, what what I find is that sometimes when you're, you're a caregiver or you have a patient, um, especially in the, in the, in a caregiver role, a lot of times parents especially want to protect their children from their feelings and have things that they want to say, but don't want to say them because they don't want to upset their daughter or their son. Um, so opening up that opportunity and the act of listening, I find that, um, sometimes when someone mentions something, it's really not that they, that they slipped that they really want to talk about it and they're looking to see what your reaction is going to be um, when they ask that question or, or to talk about things. Oh, such a good point. Yeah, I mean, this happens, a, I'm sorry if I just cut you off, it's, it's such no, a good point. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, and it goes in directions, it's all directions, friends or family trying to protect the patient and the patient trying, and before you know it, everyone's got this weird kind of conspiracy of silence and testing uh -huh. each other what to say or what to do and sitting on a bunch of shared stuff that never gets spoken so okay. yeah right on be listening for these little trial balloons from them and you might be doing the same for your own needs with them towards them exactly yeah it's really about like being in the moment and listening and and sharing really mm -hmm. and can i say one more thing as you're talking sure. too like, you know I, Maybe some of the times we say things here that may seem so obvious, but you know, tears are not the enemy. So sometimes, like if you're at a cocktail party, you say something and you see someone well up, and you feel like, oh shit, I just stepped in it. I gotta find a way out. This poor person. Uh -huh. In the in this mode we're talking about, that's this is not a polite engagement most of the time. This is a real, you know, other things, bigger things going on than than, than uh, you know, polite. So tears is a beautiful thing. Let those come, invite them, you know, don't shush them, whether they're your own or your parents or the person you're caring for. Those are the moments where cracking people are cracking open, all sorts of stuff. Uh -huh. so, it, it's yeah. really interesting that you say that too about the tears, because I was I was just talking to a, a, a chaplain the other day and we were talking about um, when, a, when someone starts to cry and oftentimes our immediate response is to give them a tissue or something like that. And we think that we're doing that like out of a, kind of in a loving space but mm -hmm. studies have shown that if you give somebody a tissue it's kind of like a, uh, a silent message not to cry and oftentimes it's better just to let the person cry and when they need the tissue they'll ask for it yeah which i thought was interesting yeah i never thought about that i had neither and i do know i oftentimes have my find myself handing someone a kleenex uh -huh. yeah but I take that point, you know, I mean, it's certain, I don't know, these are hard and fast rules, um, but I think I, I take your point. Be careful of the weary signals, the projections. Oh. We're uncomfortable with some of these people. We end up trying to shush them one way or another. Yep. 
I'm with you. That's a really good note to keep an eye out for. Um, yeah, gosh, something as you were saying that made me think about one more point. Anyway, more was there more that you'd like to say or ask? No, that's that's all I wanted to ask. And, well, I actually had sent in a question um, that hmm. I I am a an end of life doula. Uh huh. So I was just wondering what you think about how that is playing or is going to play into caregiving in the future right on well uh, let's yes and it reminds me i can't remember now if when i and i think the first question of today's little conversation um when the person was commenting about uh, concerns about her mom across country you know so I, I think i may have forgotten so to mention doulas death doulas can be a wonderful addition usually for hire so uh -huh. it's not covered by insurance and you can say right. more than that here but that doulas definitely belong on the list, especially if, if in the advanced stages of illness. But death doula is a beautiful is a beautiful work where you can get a person who's skilled to be on the ground with somebody. Um, I can I should cut to you to describe this. Doula work actually belongs on the list of potential caregivers for hire to bring to the mix. Uh, that's one point. Um, did you, is there anything more you want to say to the audience here about what doulas do and when to think of reaching out to a doula? Um, sure. So, um, so doulas are uh, a non-medical professional, and they provide spiritual, emotional comfort to patients. Um, some doulas are educated in, in disease process and medications. Although we don't give medications, we can educate on that. Um, and they kind of hold the space and keep the family together. And it's it's an assurance that what you're feeling is okay. What you're seeing as somebody transitions is normal. It's encouraging that conversation, encouraging forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also stressing the importance of self-care. Being, being a caregiver is hard work. And if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of somebody else. Mm -hmm. right um, I, yeah, I, I mean, unfortunately, doulas are not, not a covered benefit. But um, with insurance or Medicare, but they're they're looking to change that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the hospice is fabulous. I also um, I volunteer for hospice, and I've been doing that now for about four years, and I mm -hmm. think they're fantastic. But they're just limited to what yeah. they can provide because of all the all the unfortunate guidelines with our healthcare system. Yeah, and it's right. I mean, I think hospice is an invaluable service, generally speaking, invaluable. but by itself, by itself is inadequate, won't, won't take care of everything, just can't for all right. sorts of reasons. So, yep. Right on. So that points me to kind of one of the responses to your comment. Uh, you know, the, absolutely, I think uh, ideally doula work, um, family, friends, hospice or palliative care, <laughs> that sounds fun wherever you are. That sounds fun. I want to be on a motorcycle. Okay. Um, but these are all complementary, non redundant services. So it can make a lot of sense to have friends and family around, a doula around, and a hospice agency around if we're talking about end of life care, for example. These are not redundant. There's a room for everyone to play together. And that's when things are really cooking. Um, as you're pointing out, that does take some amount of money, generally speaking, to pay out of pocket, et cetera. But I love I love when a patient has both hospice and doula doulas engaged because we know there's just so much work and so much opportunity in the mix and some more skilled folks in the uh, helping out generally speaking the better. But did that answer your question? Um, did I did I hear your question right? Oh, maybe we may have lost. Looks like Judith may still yeah. be maybe muted. Oh, there you are. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, you did. You did answer my question. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you, Judith, both for your volunteer work and your doula work and for showing up here and helping educate us. Um, I'm on the advisory board of INELDA, I-N-E-L-D-A dot org. I know mm -hmm. they've got, um, that's one group of many. They've got a, a directory. Because um, finding a doula in your area can be tricky. Uh, may not, you may not know where to go. So checking Anelda's directory 
in LA, I know in Lua Arthur, my friend, she's got a training program and probably has um, the, the, uh, Going With Grace is the name of her company. They probably have, if you want to reach out to them, they may know local doula resources. But while, Judith, anywhere else you might point our audience if they're looking for a doula near them, how to find how to find such a person? Yes. So you can go on to NEDA, N-E-D-A, and they have a network of doulas. And the nice thing about doulas on NEDA is um, a lot of them have taken the NEDA proficiency um, test. So it's just kind of another level of um, certification. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there's a site called Doula Givers, it's D-O-U-L-A Givers, and they have a, a site as well, and they have doulas from all over the country there, so you can find anyone that you're looking for, and if you can't find someone and you reach out to them, they will help you find someone, and there are also some doulas who will do work pro bono for patients who need the service but can't afford to pay for it. So they're a really good resource. Awesome. Great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Judith. You're That's welcome. Really, really helpful. Um, and we have one more question, I think. We should get over that. But I'll just say one more thing about doulas is I think you kind of highlighted this, Judith. One of the cool things about doula work is it's not hyper-regulated. Um, one of the downside is it's not hyper-regulated. So, so there's a lot, like whereas one hospice agency to the next, largely does much the same work. In doulas, you might find one doula is, is great at some spiritual things, but that doesn't touch the practical things and vice versa. So doula work, all the more reason to interview of that doula about what they, their skill set is, where they like to work, what they offer, because it's not as straight, standardized as the rest of the medical picture. Um, so, okay. Judith, jump back in if I'm missing a point. But otherwise, let's get to that last question, Sonia, if we can. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So this last one says, um, I'm, I am the main caregiver for my wife who is living with advanced breast cancer. Um, recently, she's been telling me that she doesn't think I love her and we're getting into a lot more fights. I don't know how to handle this personality switch or convince her that I do love her. Do you have any suggestion or insights? Well, it's, yeah, it's hard. You know, one of the, one of the things that we didn't really mention is often by virtue of being the caregiver, the closest in, you're often sort of on the receiving end of all sorts of unprocessed stuff. You may be the safest person for, for your wife to, to say hard things to or express fears and concerns. So I don't know that that's what's going on here, but that's just to note that's one of the part of the role of caregiver. Sometimes you get shot as a messenger. Sometimes fear gets played out on you, et cetera. So sometimes your job is really just to listen and be there and not take it personally, you know, but also to say that this, again, this is a relationship. So, you know, if you find yourself, well, she's the one who's dying or she's the one who's sick, so I just need to shut up and be there for her. Well, I would say push you. I don't know if this is happening for you, but, you know, it's more than okay. I'd say I would encourage you to say, honey, I hear when you say that, but that, you know, if you to share your feelings when she says that to you, not just to be there for her feeling. This is a relationship, so open that dynamic up. Those kind of comments um, that may simply be, well, not simply, but that may really be a, a fear. You know, maybe as she's trying to wrap her head around the idea that she's not going to be on the planet forever, maybe her mind goes to, oh, God, well, what's he going to do? Who's he going to love? Is he going to miss me, you know? Is he exhausted because I'm such a burden by being a, by needing his care? I mean, this is a huge issue. Patients often feel like they're a burden, and this makes them want to just run off the planet. It's a very hard feeling. I've had it myself when I was a patient. It's really tricky. So just trying to talk and name it, that may be what's going on for her, her here, more than then you're doing anything that somehow suggests you don't love her or something like that. She may, it sounds like it's very likely her just expressing fears. So trying to talk with her about that, honey, when you say that, what do you mean? I love you so much. You know, what's underneath this? Are you worried about when you go? Are you worried about what my life will look like? Or, you know, whatever it is, but trying to open up the conversation and making sure you are heard, not that you're listening to her. Of course, we need you to listen to her and hear her and hear what's behind her words. And you need to share what's going on with you. Otherwise, it ceases to be a relationship. Um, 
So those are some thoughts. Any any response there? Or am I barking up the wrong tree? Or any other details? Um, let's see. They haven't written in yet, but I will shout if yes. Okay. And then one, one more thing to say. I, again, I'm just speaking in generalities here, and it may be depending on the health situation. But as things go down the road, as we get closer to the end of life, personality changes, memory lapses, frank delirium, like disorientation can be hap can be common. So sometimes these little comments that seem sort of off can be early stages of something like delirium. So it may be worth talking to the doctor next time you're in there, making sure that this is not something else going on. I'm not, I don't want to worry you. I'm not saying that it is happening, but sometimes these comments, if they feel off, may be little uh, warning signs that delirium is in the mix. And delirium oftentimes can be treated, or at least you'll know how to hear the person. Um, so those are some other thoughts. And then lastly would be that depression, of course, is very common and may mean that your wife really would benefit from therapy. Um, and the two of you perhaps can have like a third party, you know, broker conversation between you and getting a little deeper. We do that work at mental health, for example, or finding a real skilled therapist to join you. So those are some more thoughts. Thanks, BJ. Well, it is 11. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here on a Friday afternoon. We, we appreciate it and enjoy it. So thank you so much. And like BJ said, if you or anyone you know has any additional questions about your own experiences, this is what we do at Metal. So you can check in anytime. We're, we're here to help with these exact issues. Yeah. I think that's it. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye till next time.